And welcome to MetFiz 2020, day 20. I believe we made it to day 20 already. Feels like time is flying, but also not moving at all. And I bet all of you stuck at home like me, I found some way. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on how uh, this model for doing conferences is fantastic. Apart to say I'm really proud of our speakers for allowing this to be recorded and placed onto YouTube and uh, Facebook indefinitely so that people can listen to it anywhere, any place um, at their own convenience for free. Uh, that's really accessible science. And I think that's a big piece of inclusivity. Um, Cassidy has done an amazing job with her MetFiz 2020 challenge, which is to get photos of herself in front of photos of herself every day. She keeps nailing it. Now is your time, Cassidy. Go ahead, get that photo. I'm looking forward to seeing another one. Um, the only thing that makes me realize that this photo that I'm putting up today is not the photo before is the fact that the background is changing. Uh, it's kind of like taking a photo in front of a newspaper. Um, on Friday, I mentioned that we're going to reveal today the mask uh, scientist, the mask speaker for the MetFiz 2020 challenge uh, brought to us by Abru Abe. Um, it started with a, a weird clue that we're just going to have a secret speaker and a one word clue, which was serendipity. Uh, so far, we've only had two people DM me with the answer correctly. Um, and they've both impressed me. Um, so I'm going to run through the clues very quickly. The first one was serendipity. Uh, the second one was this uh, stuffed toy next to um, a Abe. Um, then there was the little milker ad where the animal was packing chocolate or folding chocolate. Um, followed by uh, this gif, which was, I've seen it unfold on social media, but I haven't heard it from his mouth, and we need to replace social media with literature. Um, the fifth clue was um, Alanis Morissette and the song Ironic, and we're going to break that down with a dash. It should have actually been IRE1 or IR, uh, IRE. That might be giving some of you clues at home to kind of guess it. The next was this clip from a textbook cover, Essential Cell Biology. Still only one person had guessed it at this point. The next was laser with a K. Yes, laser with a K. Um, and the final clue was this piece of art. I've turned it sideways so it fits on your screen. It's actually a piece of art by the speaker tomorrow. So one person guessed it and guessed it at three clues in. Thank you, Vanessa Biles from uh, Brandon Manning's lab. This is amazing. Cheers to you. How did you do it? Um, I'm still impressed when I think about your reasoning. So here's the reasoning of Vanessa Biles, or as I like to call it, Vanessa Sherlock Biles. Um, she only needed uh, four of these clues. So clue one, and here's the answer if you've been looking at home, who is the secret speaker? It is gonna be Peter Walter from UCSF. Um, and how did you guess that from these three clues, Vanessa? This is how you did it. Um, the word serendipity, that is indeed how he describes his career. It is also the name of his lab mascot, which is pictured here next to um, Abra Airby. Um, now you picked up a clue I didn't even need to try to make. Turns out Milka, the chocolate company, um, is also German, as is Peter Walter. Um, so hey, picking up subconscious clues that I laid in by accident, fantastic. Um, and then unfolding, of course, the UPR. Um, and so well done. And then also knowing that uh, Abru works on the UPR kind of confirmed all those suspicions. So amazing job to you. Second place in this was Carolyn Cummins, our brilliant speaker from earlier. And uh, I think we can see a sex bias here. Women are much better at picking out clues than men, apparently. And uh, I think that's probably true. And so with no other basis, but this n equal to two. Um, 
Here are the other clues. Of course, IRE1 is an important uh, player in the unfolded protein response. Here is Peter with his lab mascot, Serendipity. Um, uh, he was one of the authors of this textbook. Of course, he won Alaska, which is laser with a K, and uh, he painted this art. All right. So if we are sitting in talks and we want to ask questions, how do we do that? We get onto Twitter. We use the hashtag MetFizz2020. We use the speaker's handle on Twitter if we can. If you want to follow the, the question time, just go into Twitter. You don't even have to have a password. You can just pull it up in your, in your browser. Go to the search bar and type in hashtag MetFizz2020. You'll look up some of the speakers, and you'll be able to see the conversation that's ongoing. Um, I've been retweeting them with the hashtag so that everyone can follow. And you'll see there's a fantastic uh, community discussion going on after most of these talks. Some of the uh, questions come in a few days later when people had a chance to look at the recordings. I'm enjoying that and other speakers are too. If you have questions, comments, um, feel free to just go into Twitter and, and make those happen. Um, I know everyone's enjoying that. We have made it through the first round of speakers and all of those talks are available freely on both Facebook and YouTube. On YouTube, type in MetFizz2020 and you will see all the recordings. Um, if you're having trouble picking up any of the recordings, sometimes the music elicits copyright issues, just uh, message me and I'll make sure they're resolved. Uh, sometimes it just requires a little cropping of the video and reposting them. Um, so two weeks to go. We're in the first day of our, of our second to last week. And today we're going to hear from Alex Muir uh, on what's going to be a very exciting talk. Um, and then tomorrow, as I've mentioned, we're going to hear from um, Abrue Abe and Peter Walter on the integrated stress response in cardiometabolic disease. Uh, if you have colleagues and friends that are interested, make sure that they tune in tomorrow or look up the recording. Feel free to share that. All those links are available both on Twitter, but also on our lab website, the White Magara Lab, and we're very happy to bring these to you. So without further ado, I'm going to get this over to Alex. I am going to um, make him the host. And uh, yeah, please widely share about the details about the secret speaker tomorrow. I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy hearing from Peter and also Abru. All right, so making Alex the host right now. And uh, enjoy. I'm going to see you all in the Twitter space. All right, uh, so let me start my slides up here. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and get started. I just want to say a big thank you to Phil uh, for putting together this seminar series. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic resource for everybody in the lab. Um, and having the questions and answers on, on Twitter has been great. Um, so again, big thank you to Phil and of course um, to all the speakers. This has been uh, really awesome. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you today about the work that our group has been doing um, to try to better understand the metabolism of, of cancer cells and other tumor resident cells um, actually inside of tumors um, and how we've been uh, trying to better characterize the tumor microenvironment in order to, um, uh, in order to understand how that impinges and, and regulates how cancer cells are metabolically behaving. So I have the, the talk um, kind of broken into to three sections. I'm going to start with some background and kind of what we know about the tumor microenvironment and how we, we know this plays a big part in regulating how cancer cells actually metabolically behave in situ. Um, then I'm going to uh, talk about some recently published work from, um, from my postdoc and from our group looking at how the, uh, the, the tools that we've been developing to study what actually is in the um, microenvironment to solid tumors. And then the last part of the talk, which I'm really excited about, is going to be some um, preliminary and unpublished data. Um, where we're trying to take what we know about the tumor microenvironment, having made these measurements, and actually turn this into, into new knowledge about how cancer cells metabolically function. Um, and so the, um, to get started in the background, the big questions that our group um, is really interested in understanding is, um, for cancer cells, what are the critical nutrients and the, the critical metabolic pathways that process those nutrients that tumor cells rely upon um, to support pathological phenotypes that we want to target in the clinic? 
Um, so things like the ability to grow unchecked, the ability to become resistant to the, the chemotherapies and other treatments that we use clinically right now, and of course the ability to suppress and evade the immune system that should otherwise be eliminating these cancerous cells. And our hope is if we can start to find these key nutrients and identify these key metabolic pathways, and this is something that we could hopefully readily target therapeutically. So on the nutrient supply side of the equation, if we are able to identify these critical nutrients, and we could use things like um, injectable enzymes that degrade the nutrients in the circulation, um, things like asparaginase that's already used clinically, or some of the newly developed uh, treatments like cystinase and the thiamase. Um, and then of course, we could also use the diet just to suppress the, the systemic availability of these nutrients as well. And then on the, the metabolic pathway side of the equation, um, our hope is, you know, all of these proteins that we'd like to target in metabolic pathways, um, they're metabolic enzymes. They have small molecule binding pockets, they do catalysis. And so this, kinds of, this makes most of them readily, readily available to be drugged, um, really good drug targets. And so our hope is if we can pick out these critical metabolic pathways, there would likely be a, a pathway to actually being able to manipulate them um, in, in patients. So if this is so easy to do, we just need to find these nutrients and find these metabolic pathways. Um, why haven't we been able to, to come up with really great metabolic therapies for, for cancer? Um, why don't we do this all the time? And in thinking about this, our lab kind of thinks the problem is hard and more difficult than um, initially predicted for two reasons. The, the first is that the metabolic network is really large. And so when we think about nutrient availability for cancer cells, what we know from uh, studies of uh, metabolomic studies of plasma is that there's at least 4,500 known circulating nutrients um, that, that cancer cells are gonna have access to from the circulation. Um, and once these cells take up these nutrients, um, they have a huge network of some 3,500, almost 4,000 uh, known enzymes and transporters that they can use to bring in, move around those metabolites, and of course, interconvert them. And so when we start to think about identifying these key nutrients and metabolic pathways we want to target, it really is kind of a needle in a haystack question. It's not like there's a small number of pathways or, or nutrients we need to be worrying about. There's thousands and thousands that we need to be able to sort through. And I think fortunately for us, um, on the technological side of things, there's been a lot of advances that makes it easy to or easier to parse through all of these metabolites and all of these metabolic pathways. Um, so in terms of finding uh, and looking for critical nutrients, we have really wonderful met uh, metabolomics technologies now that can let us identify nutrients um, uh, more readily than could be done in the past. And there's some really great work uh, actually looking at which of these nutrients are being taken up in vivo by, uh, by tumors. Uh, one of the speakers, Tony Wee, a couple of weeks ago, I think has some really fantastic um, technologies and data to start to figure out um, what metabolites tumors are actually taking up, um, and normal organs, of course, as well. And then on the, the metabolic enzyme side of the equation, uh, we have great tools like, uh, um, uh, like Isaac, Harris, Isaac Harris's drug library that he was talking about last week, or CRISPR screening that we can use to systematically, genetically kind of march through um, and look for which of these metabolic pathways and, and enzymes may be important for a given phenotype. So I'm really hopeful on the technology side of things that we're gonna be able to um, better um, parse through this big um, uh, metabolism space more rapidly in the future. Um, but this doesn't really solve the second part of why identifying these key metabolic pathways for cancer physiology, why, why it's difficult. And that is that a metabolism by its very nature is, is really dynamic. And what I mean by that is we take genetically identical cells, so clones of each other, um, and they're endowed with the exact same metabolic network. And that's kind of outlined here as a series of interconnecting nodes and edges. If we take these cells, same metabolic network, genetically the same, but we put them into two different environments. Um, and what I mean by environments is that could be changes in oxygenation, changes in nutrient level, um, differences in stromal interactions, um, uh, differences in ECM properties, electrolyte balance, and of course, signaling cues. If you actually go in and look at how these cells are, are using the metabolism they're endowed with, this can be really, really dramatically different. Um, so in the schematic, cells in environment A may prefer to run this set of reactions here on the right. In contrast, cells in environment B may be preferring to run these reactions over here on the right in red. And downstream of these changes in metabolism that are induced by the environment, you can get big changes in phenotype as well. And so of course, as the diagram indicates, um, pathway usage can be different. Um, nutrient utilization can be different as well. 
And then of course, from a clinical perspective, at the end of the day, this can have a really big impact on um, how or if uh, the cells are responding to drugs. And to um, really um, give a, a, an example of how dramatic this can be, I want to talk about a response to a drug, uh, a metabolism targeted drug for, for cancer, a targeting glutaminase, um, and how the microenvironment can really change how um, tumors respond to this. And so um, to, to introduce the glutaminase pathway and, and uh, the drug I want to talk about, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the TCA cycle just to give a little bit of background. And we all know this is the, the uh, kind of linked set of biochemical reactions that cells can use to take um, uh, pyruvate derived from glucose and sequentially oxidize this to generate reducing equivalents, which the cell then uses to generate ATP or energy for homeostasis. But the TCA cycle also has critical other functions, including uh, the ability to generate biomass precursors. So every intermediate in the TCA cycle can be withdrawn and can be used to make biomass precursors, amino acids, lipids, uh, nucleotides, which ultimate, ultimately can enable um, and underpin really growth and proliferation. Um, so cells that are using the TCA cycle both for energy and for biomass production um, have to have a way to put um, material or carbon back into the TCA cycle. Um, this is termed anaplerosis. And in particular, um, uh, cancer cells historically for about 20 or 30 years now have been thought to primarily accomplish um, anaplerosis into the TCA cycle by breakdown of this amino acid called glutamine in a pathway that's initiated by this enzyme called glutaminase. And so the thought is glutamine gets broken down, enters into the TCA cycle, and this feeds biomass production and growth. And this is um, thought to be broadly true in cancers. If you look across cancer types in cell culture, you know, approximately 80% of cancer cells are, are glutamine addicted is the term for this. And this of course leads to a tremendous amount of excitement um, for in pharmaceutically targeting the uh, glutaminase. And this culminated in the development of a, a now clinically used uh, glutaminase inhibitor called CB839. And of course the hope with this compound is, is that you can treat patients with this compound. This will shut down anaplerosis inside of the tumor cells. And then hopefully um, basically bankrupt the TCA cycle and prevent the ability of, of cancer cells to make these precious biomass precursors and, and ultimately grow and proliferate. And so um, does this actually work? And so I'm going to show some data from a really interesting study from Alec Kimmelman's group from a couple of years back, and where they're looking at uh, mouse pancreatic tumors, just asking if inhibiting this pathway could um, suppress the growth and actually treat um, these pancreatic tumors in mice. And so in an in vitro study, they took um, cultured mouse PDAC tumors, and they're able to, to grow them. And if they're untreated, you can see they grow really rapidly. But if you hit them with even a low concentration of CBA39, that's not necessarily even saturating. This has uh, pretty dramatic anti-growth effects on these tumor, uh, on these isolated cancer cells. And so at least in vitro, inhibiting this pathway um, broadly has fantastic effects on being able to um, slow the growth of these cancer cells. Um, but what happens if you try to slow the growth of tumors in vivo? And so the Kimmelman lab did a really interesting experiment where they took these exact cultured mouse pancreatic cancer cells and they injected them into the pancreas of a mouse and then started treating these mice um, with CB839. And unfortunately, what you can see in, in, in monitoring growth of these tumors, and unfortunately, in contrast to the in vitro situation where you get these really dramatic effects on uh, cancer cell growth. In vivo, you basically see no difference in the ability of cells to grow um, when the, the glutaminase enzyme has been inhibited. I just wanna say that this is not just a drug delivery issue in vivo. Um, you can do uh, ex vivo glutaminase activity assays where you take isolated tumor chunks and measure the activity of glutaminase in those tumor, um, uh, in those excised tumors. And you can see that the drug is actually having its intended effect um, it is inhibiting glutaminase activity. It's just somehow um, these cells, um, these mouse pancreatic cancer cells, no longer care about this pathway when they're growing um, in vitro compared to when, or when they're growing in vivo compared to when they're growing um, in vitro. So I think this is a really uh, excellent kind of textbook example of how the environment can change the metabolism and, and drug sensitivities of, of cancer cells. So in, if you take these genetically identical mouse pancreatic cancers and you grow them in vitro, 
they really heavily rely on this glutamine breakdown pathway to fuel the TCA cycle and get all of this biomass in order to enable growth. And an end result of this phenotypically, they're extremely sensitive to this drug. Uh, but the exact same cells, unfortunately, now in the environment that we actually care about a tumor in vivo, this pathway is totally dispensable. And these cells are doing, or have found some other way to push carbon into the TCA cycle. And unfortunately, the end result of that is that this drug that we we're really excited about, we're really hoping that would be able to, to slow the growth of these tumors, these cancer cells don't actually respond to inhibiting this pathway at all. And so, um, Kind of the, the take home lesson that we've um, kind of internalized in the lab from these studies is we think about this map of metabolism um, that we have, which I I'll frequently say this is really a gift to us from 200 years of biochemistry that we can you know, know all of the, most of the, the products and enzymes that, it, um, that uh, all the reactions that a cell can do. It's important to think that, this is still important to know that this map has um, uh, limitations for, um, how we think about cells actually using this map. This, this map of metabolism, I'd like to think of it as roughly a, a roadmap of a city, in this case, Chicago. This tells us all of the routes that it's possible to use to get around the city. But if we want to know a different piece of information, which is, you know, how does the city actually use its roads? How does the cell actually use its metabolic pathways? We need a different piece of information. We need something like a, a traffic overlay. And this can tell us, you know, which roads in green are pretty empty and not actually being used. Um, compared to roads that are red, which are actively being used by a cell at any given time. I think the really important difference between just that kind of static roadmap, that atlas versus these traffic overlays, is the roadmap is fixed. It's not going anywhere. It's not really changing on any um, time scale that we're used to thinking about. Um, in contrast, these traffic overlays change all the time and they change by the minute. And if we really want to know how these roads are being used, it's not enough just to have that, that atlas or that roadmap we need to have some additional pieces of information. We need to know some context. And so you can kind of, if you know that it's Chicago Sunday morning, it's a totally different context and how the roads are going to be used is totally different compared to Chicago Monday morning. And so that's what our group has been trying to do is to try to provide some additional context for how, what these um, cancer cells are, are experiencing in vivo so we can better understand how they're, how they're using their, their metabolic routes. And so going back to the questions that really motivate our group, you know, what are the nutrients, what are the metabolic pathways that, that are underpinning these phenotypes that we want to target? Uh, we think it's not enough to ask this question in any arbitrary environments or in any um, arbitrary conditions or context. We really need to be asking this question when cancer cells are actually in situ in the environment of their tumor, when they're constrained by that microenvironment, how are they using metabolism then to support the, the pathological phenotypes that we were going after? And in order to, to start to answer this kind of more specific, more directed question, we really need to have a handle on what the microenvironment of the tumor is actually like. And so there's a, a number of factors in the tumor microenvironment with the TME that we know that, um, and, and in theory, all of these could be influencing how cancer cells are metabolically behaving. And so of course, there's other cells in the, in the neighborhood of that tumor. And there's, and there's really great studies from Hal Kimmelman, Costas Lysiotis, and others um, how the, the, cell, the cellular neighborhood, these cells can interact and that can influence the metabolism that the cells are doing. And increasingly, we have pretty amazing tools, single cell RNA-seq, um, uh, multiplexed immunohistochemistry, so we can also get spatial information that's kind of um, giving us a lot of insight to what the cellular neighborhood looks like. And there's also physical structure of the tumor itself, like the extracellular matrix. And again, increasingly, we have um, amazing studies from Valerie Weaver, um, about the Bradness and others that um, kind of provide us some insight and, and tell us that the extracellular matrix, the physical properties of it do influence how the cancer cells metabolically behave. And increasingly we have really good proteomics tools to ask, you know, what are the components of that extracellular matrix and good physical tools to ask what are the properties of that matrix. And of course, gas exchange, O2 and CO2 availability, so many great classical studies that in, this also influences the metabolism in, uh, of tumor cells in the microenvironment. And then up here in the upper right-hand quadrant, and there's also this soluble component of the tumor microenvironment or the interstitial fluid. Um, and this is kind of one of the, kind of the, the, the quadrant of, of the tumor microenvironment that's been the least um, well-characterized. 
And so we were really excited in trying to think about how the tumor microenvironment could be impinging upon the, the metabolism in cancer cells. Um, we were really excited to start to think about how the interstitial um, fluid could be impinging on, on cancer cell metabolism. And first, like I was talking about, this is kind of one of the least well-characterized parts of the, the tumor microenvironment. So we're really excited to, to start to dig in there and ask, you know, uh, and just describe and characterize what the interstitial fluid is like. And then specific to metabolism, and, re and really the important reason why we started, decided to start looking at the, the interstitial fluid is that this is actually the medium the, the, that carries nutrients and carries away waste to and from cancer cells and, and other tumor resident cells in the tumor microenvironment. And so we reasoned that this could have a, a really outsized effect on, on the metabolism that cancer cells are doing. Or another way of thinking about this is that if you imagine that tumors are kind of like a diner and cancer cells are patrons in this diner, for the last hundred some odd years, we've been trying to figure out what it is that cancer cells are eating in this diner. Um, we've basically been trying to do this without having any sense of what's on the menu. And uh, that kind of doesn't provide any constraints at all. Anything is kind of possible if we have no idea what substrates could be metabolized. And so we're really hopeful that if we're able to go in and describe what's in this interstitial fluid, this could help us kind of fill in the menu um, that cancer cells could be consuming in this, in this um, tumor microenvironment di diner. And hopefully that this would give us some important constraints and help us figure out how cancer cells are metabolically um, actually living in situ inside of the tumors. And so this is what we set out to do in the lab. Um, and this kind of brings us to the second chunk of the talk, defining, um, metabolically speaking, what the tumor microenvironment is like. And so we first asked, you know, how are cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment fed? And so this is kind of a schematic to illustrate this. Uh, for normal tissues and tumors, arterial blood vessels come into the tumor, and these split out into a microcapillary network. And this microcapillary network basically acts as a, as a filtration system. And it's going to retain all of the cells, red blood cells, um, and a good chunk of the protein that's floating around in the plasma and the circulation. But it's going to filter out a nutrient-rich fluid um, into the interstitial space of the tumor and the tissue. And this is called the interstitial fluid. And this is actually the fluid that's going to come in contact and bring the nutrients to the cancer cells and, and carry away the waste. This eventually gets reabsorbed um, by, on the venous side of the capillary network or um, enters into the lymph. And so we want to know how cancer cells are fed inside of a tumor. We really want to know what's in this interstitial fluid. And so what is kind of broadly known about interstitial fluid? And so there's some great physiology studies um, from the last uh, 60 or 70 years where people looked at the interstitial environment of normal tissues. And normal tissues are known uh, histologically to have this really nice, uh, well-organized vasculature that really speeds the, the perfusion and movement of blood and plasma um, through the, the body of these tissues. And so where people have looked, if you look at metabolite concentrations in the interstitial fluid and in the plasma, they tend to be really close to each other. Basically, the interstitial fluid environment of most tissues is um, pretty well in equilibrium with what's in the plasma. Um, in contrast, tumors are known to have this really wild and kind of wacky and abnormal vasculature. Um, and uh, particularly in pancreatic tumors, which we study a lot in, in our group, you know, it's been estimated um, that perhaps, this is work from Ken Olive's group and others, that, you know, maybe only 25% of the blood vessels in these tumors are actively transporting anything um, at any given time. And so the thought is, is that these tumors are going to be well out of equilibrium with what's going on in the circulation that the tumor interstitial fluid, or TIF, as I'll kind of abbreviate it for the rest of the talk, the thought has been that this is likely to be nutrient poor. And of course, as we talked about, this could be an environmental factor that could have a really outsized role in, in influencing the, the, metabolism, the metabolism of these cancer cells. And in particular, in our group, we're really interested in, in knowing um, if this is actually true, because normal tissues aren't really exposed to this kind of nutrient deprivation. And so if cancer, if tumors really do have this abnormal metabolic microenvironment, um, that maybe opens up a therapeutic window for us for targeting metabolism, because this is something that tumor cells specifically are going to have to deal with, but um, healthy cells and normal tissues aren't going to have these kinds of constraints. Um, unfortunately, um, there really um, hasn't been any studies that have systematically given us a handle on what tumor nutrition is like, which has really impeded our ability to kind of know how um, the TIF could be affecting um, cancer cell metabolism. And so 
to, to address these questions, our group set out to isolate um, interstitial fluid from solid tumors, and then to also develop some tools to, once we have this isolated interstitial fluid, to actually measure you know, what nutrients are, are present and at what levels inside of this um, uh, tumor-direct fluid. And so um, we use some classical me uh, methods from uh, Helga Wiggs group, uh, University of Norway, Oslo, and where we can take um, uh, to isolate interstitial fluid. And, and um, the method basically is, is pretty simple and how it works is we rapidly dissect out uh, tumors from tumor bearing animals. And at the same time, we collect um, plasma from these animals. And once we have these tumors um, excised, we rapidly rinse off any extra tumoral fluid in saline and then blot these tumors dry and then um, take these tumors and then put them over a fine um, nylon mesh and then spin them at a really low centrifugal speed in, in the cold for about 10 minutes. And this uh, filter is going to retain all of the cells on top of the filter while um, pushing the interstitial fluid down um, into the collection tube which we then collect. And from our pancreatic, uh, from our mouse pancreatic tumors, we're typically collecting anywhere from five to 20 microliters, depending on the size of the tumor. And, um, and uh, some tumors also have more fluid than, than others as well. And so uh, we wanted to, before kind of diving in and analyzing what's in this fluid, we wanted to do a number of, of experiments to actually convince ourselves that this is really bona fide interstitial fluid and it's not contaminated with lysed cells or um, other extracellular or other intracellular fluids as well. So we did a number of controls. One of them I'm showing here is just looking at the um, uh, levels of uh, lactate dehydrogenase and intracellular enzyme in uh, chunks of tumor, um, plasma, or interstitial fluid. And the idea is, is uh, lactate dehydrogenase is intracellular, so its concentration inside of tumor cells is going to be really high. In contrast, in uh, the circulation, and in interstitial fluid, the, contra the, the, L the levels of LDH should be much lower because it's um, you know, primarily an intracellular enzyme. So we thought if we were getting a huge amount of uh, lysis of uh, uh, tumor cells by our, our TIF collection method, that this should be read out as a, a large increase and, and a, a big amount of LDH activity in our isolated fluid. So what I'm showing here is um, uh, levels of LDH. I'm using activity as a readout. You can see there's a, a huge a normalized to the amounts in tumors. There's vanishingly small amounts of um, LDH in the plasma. And we do see uh, an increase in LDH in our isolated interstitial fluid. Um, but this is still less than 1% of the total amount of LDH that's um, present in the tumor. And so we do think that there is some, there is an increase in LDH um, in the in the interstitial environment. This is probably coming from some cells that are dying, um, that are releasing lactate dehydrogenase, but we don't think that we're getting full lysis of cells by doing the centrifugation method to isolate the interstitial fluid. And so we don't, so we do think what we actually are collecting isn't going to be um, heavily contaminated with intracellular um, fluid. Another um, control that we did is we wanted to make sure as best as we could that the um, time that elapses during the isolation of the interstitial fluid isn't going to broadly change the composition of the interstitial fluid. And so the, we didn't have a direct way to measure this because the fastest way we can isolate the interstitial fluid is in this 10 minute period. We can't really go any faster and ask if there's differences between the 10 minute centrifugation and a shorter centrifugation. But we at least wanted to know, does the process of isolating interstitial fluid by this method change the composition of, the, of, a, of a total tumor chunk. And so what we did is we took um, tumors from, uh, uh, pancreatic tumors from uh, tumor bearing animals and we took these tumors and, excited and cut them in half. And one half of the tumor we immediately uh, clamped and froze for extracting tumor metabolites and used LC-based metabolomics um, to measure uh, nutrient, uh, metabolite levels. And the other half of the tumor we took it, isolated interstitial fluid from it, and then uh, freeze clamp those tumor chunks and then perform metabolomics on those um, tumor chunks. And what you can see is comparing the fresh frozen versus the tip isolated tumor chunks. And by principle component analysis, we really didn't detect that many metabolites that were um, different between the fresh frozen and the tip isolated um, tumor pieces. And so from this, we kind of conclude that on a global level, we're not really changing metabolite levels um, in the tumor chunks um, 
that much by the centrifugation method. And we're hoping that um, that means uh, that we're hopefully not conditioning the tip as we're collecting it um, too much. Although, of course, we'll have to develop some orthogonal methods or faster ways to isolate the interstitial fluid to actually um, know if this is true for sure. All right, so now that we actually have these TIF samples and we're reasonably confident that this is actually the interstitial fluid that we want to be studying, how can we measure what metabolites are, are present, what nutrients are present in it? And so we really wanted to have a quantitative measurement for what the metabolites are, not just a relative uh, measurement between the plasma and the TIF, for example. We really wanted to be able to say for glucose, this is how much there is in, in a millimolar unit, for example. And so what we did is we and developed a method to, to quantitate a large number of metabolites simultaneously by uh, LCMS. Uh, in this method, we take uh, yeast and we grow them with 13C glucose as the sole carbon source. Um, and then we can take uh, these yeast and extract metabolites from them. And what this gives us is a mixture of 13C metabolites um, covering a, a whole broad range of, of metabolite classes. And unfortunately, because this is coming from the, this biological sample coming from the yeast, we don't really know what the concentration of these metabolites are. And so what we next do is we take a, a 12C chemical standard library that we constructed. And this has a, 140 major nutrients and vitamins that are, that are covered in this. And we take this chemical standard library at known concentrations and we spike this in to our yeast extract. And then we run this on the mass spectrometer and what we can do is we can compare the peak areas of our 13C metabolites coming from the yeast with our, cell, our 12C metabolites coming from uh, our chemical standards at known concentrations. And we can infer now the concentrations of these, the amounts of these 13C metabolites in our yeast sample. Kind of gives us a quantitative uh, internal standard, which we can then take and spike this in, this quantitative yeast 13C standard. We can spike this in to our tip and plasma samples and run this on the mass spec. And now we're comparing a 12C metabolite coming from the interstitial fluid, which we don't know, to our 13C metabolite, which we do know. And this now gives us and allows us to infer absolute concentrations of all 150 of these metabolites in our, in our biofluid samples. And so coming back to our map of metabolism, we're really excited here because all of these metabolites that are now highlighted in a black dot, this is a metabolite or a vitamin or a nutrient that we can now get that absolute concentration of in, in a biofluid sample. This, as you can see, covers a, a large chunk of, of important metabolic pathways and nutrients. There's a couple uh, key areas in metabolism that we've still not been able to, to really quantitatively study, although we're working on developing um, techniques in the lab to look at um, lipid availability in biofluid samples and, and measuring free fatty acid concentrations, as well as measuring uh, sterile availability in these biofluids as well. Um, and so we wanted, we also did a, a number of control experiments to make sure that this method was going to be both accurate and reproducible for, for quantitating metabolite concentrations in, in biofluid samples as well. So the first experiment that we did, uh, shown here on the left, uh, we wanted to gauge how well our method was able to um, recover concentrations of metabolites from a, a standard, uh, from a plasma standard from the National Institute of Standards. Um, where concentrations of a number of metabolites are annotated and known. So what you can see is if we plot known concentrations from this plasma sample against our concentrations that we recovered from our method, you can see they're really well in agreement with each other. And so we do think that our method, that this kind of yeast-based system for quantitating metabolite levels is, um, is accurate. And we also did a number of, uh, an additional experiment where we took an interstitial fluid sample and quantitated metabolites in it. And then took that sample, put it back in the freezer for six months, and came back six months later, thought it, and uh, quantitated metabolites in that uh, sample again on a different mass spectrometer using different yeast extract. What you can see is the concentrations that we measure in replicate one of the same sample versus replicate two are pretty well in agreement with each other, despite all of the kind of experimental variation that we threw at this sample. So we do think that our method is both accurate by comparison to the, the NIST plasma sample and, and reproducible as well. And so now that we have this, this way to get interstitial fluid, and we have this, this tool now to measure what the concentrations are of nutrients in this fluid, what actually is floating around in these tumors? And so uh, we started um, by taking a look 
at concentrations of um, nutrients in uh, interstitial fluid of a mouse model of pancreatic uh, cancer and comparing this to plasma from tumor bearing animals. And when we look by principal component analysis of all 150 uh, metabolite concentrations that we're measuring, you can uh, see at kind of a global level um, uh, that these things cluster apart from each other. And so, uh, you know, maybe this kind of seems like uh, kind of obvious going into this. This is maybe what we expected, but I think, again, this is something we're really excited about because this actually does mean that the the metabolic microenvironment is, of these pancreas tumors is really kind of unique and different from what's going on um, in the rest of the, the organism. It really is this kind of unique own metabolic compartment. So we've gone in now and asked what are the individual metabolites that are kind of driving this global difference in, in nutrient availability inside of these tumors. And there's really a ton of surprises for us in this data. So this is a volcano plot showing you know, metabolite concentrations in Again, these mouse pancreas tumors versus plasma from the same animals, uh, where full changes on the uh, x-axis and uh, significance is on the y. And going into this uh, kind of project, you know, we always uh, kind of thought that the nutrient microenvironment is going to be deprived. There's going to be a lot of metabolites that are just missing. Um, if we look over here on the, the right upper quadrant of this chart, this is actually kind of telling us the, the opposite there's actually a large number of metabolites that are actually increasing um, in concentration. And so what are some of these metabolites? Um, there's some amino acids like glutamate and glycine that do increase dramatically in concentration inside of the tumor microenvironment. And we're really, um, you know, these, these are kind of things that maybe kind of made sense to us. You know, glutamate and glycine, um, cancer cells in culture are known to secrete pretty high levels of these metabolites. So, you know, maybe this made sense to us. There's a lot of cancer cells in these tumors. Maybe these are just kind of waste products that are accumulating. But there's a whole slew of other metabolites, uh, neurotransmitters like GABA, uh, redox tripeptide, which we heard a ton about from Isaac Harris, glutathione. These are also accumulating to really high concentrations inside of the tumors. And we really have no idea where these metabolites are coming from or, or why, they're, um, why they're increasing or what physiological um, role they might be playing inside of the tumor. And so we're really excited to start to parse out um, these questions for these metabolites that are, are accumulating inside of the tumor. Um, in the center part of this chart, of course, are the, the metabolites that don't really change that much in concentration between the plasma and the interstitial fluid. And again, there was a, a lot of surprises for us here. You know, glucose and glutamine, these are two uh, metabolites that cancer cells in culture, these are the most aggressively consumed. And so going into this project, you know, we really assumed that glucose and glutamine were going to be really heavily depleted in the tumor microenvironment. We didn't actually see any evidence of glutamine deprivation inside of these mouse pancreas tumors. And glucose is significantly depleted, although this is only really to a pretty minimal degree. There's still um, two to three um, millimolar glucose that's um, floating around in these tumors. So it's not like it's really um, substantially um, depleted. And then, of course, there are those metabolites that are pretty um, significantly depleted in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, there's a, a trio of amino acids, arginine, tryptophan, and unlabeled, but up here, uh, cysteine, that are uh, really heavily depleted in the microenvironment, as well as some organic acids like uh, pyruvate as well. So we're really interested in also trying to understand, you know, where these metabolites are going in the tumor microenvironment. And again, what physiological role deprivation of these nutrients can have inside of the tumors. All right, so I'll, I'll sum up some of the studies that we've been doing asking, you know, what are the factors that influence um, local concentrations of metabolites in these tumors? And because this is published, and I want to um, now get into some of the exciting unpublished data that we have. So we've done a number of uh, additional experiments where we've taken uh, uh, pancreas tumors and transplanted them into different anatomical sites and then looked at the interstitial fluid nutrient levels. And we do see that there is differences in nutrient composition in the interstitial fluid depending on anatomically where the tumor is. So we're really excited about that. We think that has some important implications for targeting metabolism in primary versus metastatic tumors. But we've also looked at how tumor type, so like a lung versus a pancreas tumor, how that also influences the nutrient composition of the tumor as well. We did that by taking advantage of uh, tumors that are derived from uh, pancreas cells that are driven by KRAS and, and P53 loss, and then doing the exact same study 
in a, a lung cancer that's driven by the same long genes. And then we've also looked at how animal diet um, influences nutrient composition in the interstitial fluid as well. And of course, diet has profound uh, effects on what's floating around in the circulation. And not surprisingly, this also impacts on what's locally available in, in the tumor compartment as well. Um, and I just want to give a, a, a couple of sentences too on some of the, the previously ongoing, but hopefully will be um, going on in the future once we have the lab back up and running again. Some future interstitial fluid studies that we're also working on as well, looking at how treatment um, for different tumor types impacts the, the local con uh, concentration of nutrients as well. We've also been doing some studies looking at uh, how different tumor resident cells contribute to the metabolic microenvironment. We're hoping by eliminating different uh, tumor resident cell types and then looking at the interstitial fluid that can give us some in, uh, insight into how different um, cells in the microenvironment are, are metabolically um, um, uh, communicating with each other and how, and how um, different tumor resident cells impact what metabolites are available. And then lastly, we've also been expanding our analysis of interstitial fluid samples that we have uh, to measure things beyond just the, the metabolites that are present. We've also been doing some studies to uh, measure cytokine and growth factor levels inside of the interstitial fluid as well as um, studies measuring um, electrolyte balance. And we're, we're really hopeful that uh, all these studies will give us um, a much better insight into kind of what the soluble microenvironment of these tumors is like and how this um, is impacted by different cells that are present and, and different ways that we perturb um, tumors by, by treatment. All right, and so the last part of the talk, I really wanna dive in and um, discuss some of the, the more recent studies that we've been uh, doing to try to actually learn something about how tumor cells are working for having made these measurements and observations about what the microenvironment of the tumor is like. Um, and I'm kind of going to break this part of the talk into two subsections. The first part of the talk, I'm going to discuss some new models that we've been building in the, in the lab to study um, uh, PDAC metabolism. And then the second part of the talk is going to be about some specific hypotheses that we have about PDAC metabolism based on some of those really deprived nutrients that we observed in the, in the tumor microenvironment. All right, so uh, jumping into this kind of new, um, new tools for um, and, and new models for studying pancreatic cancer metabolism, we were really motivated to, to develop these tools because when it, comes for, when it comes to models for studying cancer metabolism, we really think that um, the field is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the, on the one end of the spectrum, I guess this is the rock or the hard place, you have standard cell culture models. And these models are great for studying metabolism because they're super tractable. You can do any kind of experiment that you want from a CRISPR screen to um, metabolomics-based experiments, tracing experiments. Um, unfortunately, this tractability is really, um, for, for what these models have in terms of tractability, they unfortunately can be lacking in terms of physiological relevance. And that's kind of a lesson that we learned from that glutaminase and CBA39 story. They, these models may send you kind of on a, a wild goose chase. On the other end of the spectrum, we have animal models of cancer, which we think are great because we think these are great models and they're physiologically relevant for the human diseases that we're trying to study. Um, but unfortunately, um, these models, uh, what they have in terms of relevance for the disease that we want to study are oftentimes lacking in terms of tractability. There's just a lot of experiments and a lot of studies that we'd like to be able to do that aren't possible um, in an in vivo setting. And so we really wanted to to set out and develop a, a new um, system to study cancer metabolism, where we could take the, the new information that we have about the tumor microenvironment and tumor physiology and build this into an ex vivo model. And hopefully this would kind of have a little bit of the best of both worlds and kind of offset the, the, um, the weaknesses of both of these models where we could have an ex vivo model that's going to be tractable and then hopefully be a little bit more physiologically relevant by including this information that we've now, uh, this new information that we've now um, observed in the tumor microenvironment. And so what we've done is we've developed a new cell culture medium that we're calling TIPM for tumor interstitial fluid medium. And what this is, is this is a, a cell culture formulation that has 115 metabolites and vitamins um, that this is, that are, that are actually present at the concentrations that we observed inside of the interstitial fluid of these pancreas tumors. 
and then um, using some protocols from Severio Tardito lab um, at the Beetson Institute and Jason Cantor at Wisconsin, uh, we prepare this media as 10 pools of compounded dry metabolites. And we can take these pools of metabolites and then uh, reconstitute them in a, a RPMI base that has RPMI and organic um, salts. And then we also provide 10% dialyzed FBS, which provides the um, protein and the, the lipid factors that are required for, for cellular growth. Um, and of course, as we're making more measurements of electrolyte balance, we're really excited to go back and, and kind of iteratively improve this and include um, salts at concentrations in, in our formulation that we actually measure as well. So we do think that this is a process that's going to um, get better over time as we make more and more observations about the tumor microenvironment. And so over here on the right, I just have a chart illustrating the concentration of um, um, a variety of metabolites. Each dot is a different metabolite. Um, in our TIFM formulation versus our PMI. This is really just to illustrate that um, TIFM and the tumor microenvironment, nutritionally speaking, is really different from standard culture formulations like our PMI. Our PMI, of course, has a huge number of metabolites that are present at log fold um, increase in concentration compared to what's present in the tumor microenvironment. We're also really excited that um, our um, TIFM system, too, is now going to have of course, a large number of metabolites and concentrations uh, uh, that are um, much higher in our PMI as well. Um, but in particular, we're also really excited about this bottom chunk of the graph here. These are a whole set of metabolites that typically we've never grown ourselves in culture with these nutrients at all. This includes things like glutathione and creatine and creatine. We're really interested to know, you know how cells are actually metabolically engaging with these nutrients at all. This is something that we typically haven't been able to study using standard cell culture that totally doesn't include these um, metabolites at all. And so how have we been using this TIFM in the lab now that we have it? But we started by taking um, uh, mouse uh, PDAC tumors, and we can take these tumors, dissociate them to single cells, and sort out the cancer cells. And we've taken um, isolated cancer cells from individual tumors, and then split them and grown them in pairs, either in standard uh, cell culture medium, like our PMI, or in our new TIFM cell culture system. And the, the first thing that we've observed is, um, we've done this for a number of different um, individual mouse PDAC tumors now, and we've always been able to get um, cell lines that are able to grow in both standard culture or in TIF media. And at a gross level, what we've initially observed is that cells in the TIF um, system, um, they grow and they grow forever, or at least for years, how long we've had them in culture, like cancer cells are going to want to do. Um, but the thing we've always observed is they do grow substantially three to four times slower than their RPMI counterpart. So um, we also wanted to know is, do these cells, um, when we're growing them in the TIFM system, do they, do we have any evidence at all that they're actually behaving more um, like uh, PDAC cells behave inside of a tumor in vivo? So one experiment that we did went back to this observation from the Kimmelman lab, where cells cultured in, in standard media, isolated PDAC cells in standard media, are really responsive to the inhibition of glutaminase, whereas cells growing in tumors are largely, exact same cells growing in tumors are largely not responsive um, to these therapies. And so we took our uh, paired cell lines in either our PMI or our TIFM, and just asked how did they, these cells respond to inhibition of glutaminase um, using um, CV839. And so for cells in standard culture, we're totally able to recapitulate what everybody in the field has seen. If you treat these cells with CV839, you basically completely abrogate the ability of these cells to grow at all. And in contrast, and really exciting, we think um, if we have our cells in TIF media and now treat them with CV839, now inhibit this glutaminase pathway, these cells are much, much less responsive to inhibition of this pathway, which we think is a much better much better model and much better mimic for what's actually going on um, with these tumors, with these cancer cells in the vivo. And so, um, and so we're really excited that, at least preliminarily, at least for one metabolic pathway, that this TIFM system is giving us a, a better, more physiological handle on what the cells are metabolically doing um, in the vivo. We think we have a, a lot to learn from the TIFM system, and this is coming from a pretty simple experiment that we did. Um, I think has some pretty important implications. And this is an experiment where we took these um, paired cell lines from dissociated tumors where we had them 
um, either a cell line that was in standard culture for just about a month, or the same, or cells coming from the same tumor, but now growing in tip media um, for that same uh, period of about a month. And we just asked what happens if we have these cells um, now growing in either standard culture, RPMI, or in the TIF media? What happens if we switch the cell culture media on these cells? And so we took these cells that are growing in TIF media here on the bottom. We just swapped them over and asked, can they grow in standard culture? And when we took these, um, uh, dash TIFM just indicates this was a cell line initially derived in TIF media. These cells, and we grow them in TIF media, they keep on growing just fine. Again, much slower than the RPMI counterparts. But if we take these cells and we now move them into RPMI and ask them to grow in RPMI, indeed they do. And in fact, they start growing much, much faster, basically about the same rate as the, the cells that are initially derived in RPMI. So cells are definitely able to make that, that leap. In contrast, um, if we take a cell line that's initially derived in RPMI, and we ask what happens if we now try to grow these cells in TIF media, we see a really different behavior. In some of our paired cell lines, what we see is the cells in RPMI, that's where they're initially derived, they grow just fine. We switch them to TIF media, they basically are, are set, it's basically cytostatic. They kind of sit on the dish and they don't really grow at all. And some of our paired cell lines actually, um, not only do they not grow, they actually start to die off and we can kill the cells off in this way. And so, uh, what we've kind of taken, the lesson that we've kind of learned from this pretty simple experiments is that cells, once you um, derive them in standard, in standard cell culture conditions, they really lose the adaptations and the ability that they have to grow um, in normal tumor microenvironmental nutrient conditions. If you have them in RPMI for about a month, it's whatever, something's happening that's basically preventing them from growing in the nutrients um, that they're used to growing, um, that, that they're used to using to grow in vivo. So we really think and we maybe have a lot to learn by asking how metabolism is different in the TIFM system than what's going on in, in standard culture. And so to, to start to ask how metabolism is different in standard culture versus this TIFM um, system and to make these comparisons, we started doing a number of different experiments in our paired cell lines in, that are either growing in standard culture or in TIF media. We've been doing a number of genetic screens, metabolomics analyses, um, extracellular flux, and, and RNA-seq analysis just to ask, you know, metabolically, how are these cells, um, even though they're genetically identical, they're coming from the same tumor from the same mouse, um, how are they metabolically different? And we're really hoping that we'll be able to learn how cancer cells are utilizing metabolism to survive under TMD nutrient conditions. Now, this is going to be new, new information for us that we just haven't had from studies in, of, of cell metabolism in standard culture. And just a, a piece of the data, we, we haven't got a lot of this data back yet, but um, shortly before we went on, on quarantine, we did get some RNA-seq data back from our, our paired cell lines. And what, what we, uh, the initial analysis of this data, we do see 5,000 differentially expressed genes. Um, they're uh, differentially expressed regardless of which cell line we look, uh, which cell line we look at. These are 5,000 conserved differentially expressed genes that are they're always differentially expressed in our different selling pairs. Um, this is just a, a, a based on what nutrients are present. And so we think there's going to be a lot to learn about metabolism and probably cell biology in general um, from looking at these cells that are growing under uh, in this TIFM system under these microenvironmental nutrient constraints. And then the last thing that we've been doing to try to understand um, how metabolism is uh, uh, impacted by the, the tumor metabolic and tumor nutrition, uh, nutritional microenvironment is just to look at how pancreas cancer cells are surviving when uh, nutrients are, are missing in their microenvironment. And so uh, one of the nutrients that we've been looking at in particular, um, if you recall, is this um, amino acid arginine, which is really depleted in the microenvironments of these pancreas tumors. Uh, the most significantly um, depleted metabolite that we measured and just to give you a sense for the scale of how much arginine is depleted in the microenvironment, if you look in plasma from tumor-bearing animals, there's about 120 micromolar arginine in the circulation. In our interstitial fluid samples from this mouse model of pancreas, um, uh, pancreatic cancer, there's about two to five micromolar arginine that's, that's present. So it is this huge 30 to 50 fold drop in arginine concentration, specifically in the tumor microenvironment. 
And so we wanted to ask a pretty simple um, uh, question just to start out. You know, arginine is at the center of a lot of metabolic pathways. It contributes to a whole set of, of other biosynthetic processes uh, from the biosynthesis of creatine to the formation of polyamines. It's also a signaling molecule as well. It's uh, critical for the activation of mTOR. And of course, it's a proteinogenic amino acid that cells need it to, to make protein. And so arginine is, is really important for cancer cells. And we just wanted to know how can you have um, these really aggressive tumors in the pancreas that are going to grow really fast. They're going to kill these mice in two weeks. How are they able to be so aggressive um, even though they're missing this, this critical nutrient? And so we started to, in the lab to start to hypothesize, you know, what are ways that cancer cells could be um, getting arginine? And we, we really considered three pathways that cells, alternative pathways that cells could be using to acquire arginine. Um, the first is maybe they're acquiring it from extracellular protein. And maybe they're just very good at scavenging the limiting amount of arginine that's present in the microenvironment. Um, or uh, perhaps they're synthesizing it themselves. And so, um, we, I'm not going to dive into a lot of the data here because I want to um, get into some of the de novo synthesis data that we have, but I just want to say we did look at if um, PDAC cells are just really good at scavenging arginine, free arginine in the microenvironment. And going back to how much arginine is present in the microenvironment, they would have to be really extremely good at getting arginine um, because the, the known KM for arginine transporters is around 80 micromolar, so there's uh, the, the KM for transport is way below the availability of arginine in the microenvironment. Nevertheless, we looked and we didn't really see much of a contribution of, of the low amounts of extracellular arginine to the ability of, of PDAC cells to get arginine and, and survive. But we also wanted to ask, you know, maybe um, PDAC cells are well known to, to take up extracellular protein via a process called macropinocytosis. So we asked if we impaired macropinocytosis or lysosomal activity, could this prevent the ability of these cells to acquire